right, the, the two reviews in concession. If I, I'm not even sure if that's the right word for this shit. Now, we're reviewing fucking Ghost World. Now, some of you motherfuckers might be thinking, hey, maybe th this motherfucking Ching Chong Asian motherfucker probably he probably hasn't read, haven't read, haven't, haven't, haven't read. Re did he probably didn't read? The Ghost World graphic novel. I don't give a shit about grammar. Y you know, he probably didn't read the graphic novel. He probably calls it the comic book like a fucking noob. And guess what, bitch? Not only have I read it, I own that shit. I own... I uh, Yes. Now now for the... Let's get rid of the racist banter. Um, I have read um, Ghost World. And I can prove that by saying... Simply saying that I know that the Steve Buscemi character in the movie... Seymour is not in the book. I know that for... I, I don't know how the angles work in real life. Um, now, the film has a lot of significant changes compared to the book. And I totally understand why. Because when I finished the book, and I've read it about three times, because, you know, it's kind of made for people like me, just loser nerds. Um, the book perfectly captures the sense of being lost and bored after graduating high school in suburbia. Um, you know, being entertained by little quirky personalities, you know, just enough to not realize they need to get out of that boredom. However, this theme and this sense of humor and this sense of character development really affects the narrative of the book, which, you know, it doesn't really feel like it's... It, it honestly feels like it's... It's running in circles. It's not trying to go anywhere. You know, it's about the humor that comes from daily things. And unfortunately, it doesn't really drive the story anywhere. They don't... The main characters, Enid and Rebecca, don't really grow as people. There's this vague sense of maturity at the end. But mostly, it's about how you don't really grow as a person. How you're kind of stuck with this personality and all you can really do is to adjust the world and yourself to certain situations and surroundings. You know, it's more like, at the end, it's more like their cynicism slightly collapses. You know, the book is also way too self-centered, um, which is kind of the point, but it's it wouldn't really work for a film. So I understand why the changes are there. Now, I think the film still captures the total boredom of suburbia and the confusion that comes with becoming an adult at least when it comes to be when it comes to you know, when it comes to age age wise shit you know when it comes to your mental state you're still kind of a fucking kid i can say say that this is true i'm fucking 18 i don't know what the fuck's going on with my life so it's probably true you know the first part of the film really focuses on how they just follow people people around they just screw with other people there's this great scene where they're they're following the Satanists in the book, and in this film they exist too. And they, the movie starts playing this really dramatic classical orchestra, orchestra, orchestral music. And it has this really sarcastic tone to it, which really adds to the atmosphere of the whole film. The whole film is, in fact, like the book, very cynical. It's not as self-centered, but it's very cynical. But the second, the second... Steve Buscemi Seymour character comes in. Everything changes. Everything the movie the movie seemed to be going towards to, and everything that the movie seemed like it had um, some common grounds with the book suddenly changes. Suddenly, it's trying to go for a totally different route. And I and I think I understand this because the screenplay was written by the guy who wrote the comic book, Daniel Klaus. And I feel like, you know, it's been four years since the publication of the of the comic book. Obviously, he might have new ideas, maybe new characters to bring into this story. So, I at that point, I was kind of getting interested. And by the end of the movie, I realized that the addition of Seymour just might have been the best thing the guy could have done. You know, the Se Seymour's not in the book, like I said, but he adds so much to the movie. You know, through Seymour... The film tries to flesh out Enid. Now, the book fleshes out Enid perfectly well, just sufficiently enough. But with this film, they actually try to make her grow up and mature as a person, which is really lacking in the book. Which is the point. I get that. But, 
in this film, you know, Enid kind of starts off at this as this, you know, is she's a pretty generic, phony hating teenage girl who listens to 70s punk and ragtime blues through Seymour, obviously. And then and Seymour is basically the adult embodiment of Enid, you know, minus the spunkiness. You know, basically if Enid kept being that cynical and that self-centered and just if she just kept living in her own world like that, she would grow up like Seymour. And through Seymour, she sees herself. Falls in love, you know, for in a very self-centered manner because she tries to give him salvation through give, trying to find him a lover. And eventually, she kind of falls in love with Seymour because she sees herself. And it's a very self-centered Freudian shit shit stuff god damn it grammar grammar what is it good for um and she actually grows as a character by understanding that if she keeps going on this path that she paved as a teenager she's gonna end up like that she's gonna need help and she thinks maybe salvaging seymour's life would make my life better but it just kind of ruins it and she starts to realize her flaws and she actually grows as a fucking character and it's so great to watch um, the film, you know, really understands that the book is about wandering around, but that films are about growth. And as we see Enid becoming a more mature person with the very, um, obvious symbolism of the old guy at the bus station getting on the bus and leaving the contained life that Enid made for herself. It's a very obvious bit of symbolism, but it's effective. It's so direct. And even Enid is just kind of staring at it, and she understands what the fuck is supposed to say, and her actions all start making sense after that. Um, so personally, I think the changes and bringing Seymour in actually makes the film much more effective as a character movie. Because let's face it, the book... And the film is about character. It's about Enid. Enid really is the main focus of development here. And the book, the point is that she didn't grow up. Just a vague sense of maturity. In this film, she does grow up. And it's much more refreshing to see. I would, I, I personally like this better than if the film just did exactly what the book did. You know, I... It, it feels much more refreshing. It's much more so because I've read the book and it feels different and it feels like a different take and it's much more new. It, 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 it's not a tiring and boring ending. Um, also, I like the film that, like I said, the film is very cynical, especially in its visuals. It's very cartoonish. Cynically cartoonish, in fact. You know, there are, there's a lot of single-colored clothes. There's this gray scene where they're just walking, and in the background is this just purely red wall. And there's, in Seymour's house, the wallpapers are all, are all, like, just pure goddamn green. It looks like something that came right out of a comic book, a comic strip, a graphic novel. And it gives the film, it's kind of this individualistic image that the book also had. Um, I like the fact that the dialogue also has this cynical style to it. Obviously, Enid's and Rebecca's dialogue is very cynical because they're pseudo-intellectuals and very cynical characters themselves, but there's a lot of subtle jabs at various people. Um, there's this great scene at, in this movie rental store where this old guy come, goes up to the clerk and he's like, I would like to rent a movie, and the guy who's working, the poor guy, that he probably like has, to, he probably has to deal with a lot of fucking movie, movie snobs like me. And he's like, "Oh, how can I help you, sir?" And the guy's like, "I would like to rent a film called Eight and a Half." And you know, fucking the 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 guy at the counter's like, "Oh, let me check that." And he's like, he just types it in, and he's like, "Oh, nine and a half. It's in the adult section." And you know. The, the old guy's like, no, eight and a half, the art house film made by Federico Fellini in 1963. It's an Italy movie. I'm Donald Trump. <laughs> you know, it's suddenly, oh, it, it, but while I saw that, saw that scene, I kind of told myself, fuck it. I really like eight and a half. And that kind of reminds me of me. I really, 
I, I'm a fucking asshole, aren't I? But, you know, the film really tried to give out jabs towards as many people as possible. Probably just like what the characters would do in real life. Um, even, you know, Enid's, Enid's wardrobe is kind of ha kind of has this cynically cartoonish level of ostentatiousness to it. You know, there's this leopard print dress, a, a dress that's like pure fucking red. And a, she, at, at one point in the film, she wears a goddamn waitress outfit. And it's so over the top, but it gives the film its image. It almost feels like a really dirty Wes Anderson movie, like a really dirty-minded Wes Anderson movie. If, like, Robert E. Crumb and Daniel Klaus came together and decide to make a really dirty version of the Wes Anderson image, this would what be, this would exactly be, this would, this would be what it looked like, this would look like this, this, wait a minute, um, this is, this is what it would look like. Fuck you, grammar, I won again. I'm smarter than you, bitch. Um, are there flaws? Yes. Um, one of the flaws that I feel the film has is a very personal flaw. I think I, I might be the only person who sees this flaw. And the other flaw is kind of more of a realistic, objective point of view of a flaw. Now, the personal flaw first. Um, this is just me. I think Thora Birch is way too hot to play Enid. That's, that might be just me. Who the fuck knows? When I see Thora Birch in this movie, I, I, I see a person who cannot possibly be unpopular. You know, acting-wise, I get why she was cast. She's perfect for this role. Like, this is like two years after American Beauty. She was basically like the one of the late 90s, early 2000s, icon of teen angst in movies and it's not it's it's a very refreshing take you know compared to the freaking Dawson's Creek bullshit James Vanderbeek Freddie Prince Jr. bullshit that was happening in Hollywood you know she was more realistic she had a more sarcastic tone to her and it really I can see why she was she was cast for this role it's perfect it's the role of her lifetime but god damn it she's way too fucking hot that's just me. So, that's just me. Let's get into the realistic flaw. Personally, one of the side plots of the film is the, the, the disintegration of her relationship, you know, Enid's relationship with Rebecca, the Scarlett Johansson character. Now, this is dealt with in the book as well. However, in the film, because they have to really focus on the relationship between Enid and Seymour, it's not as focused compared to the book. And because of that, it feels very undeveloped. Not not only undeveloped, at the end, it kind of feels abrupt, at least to me. Especially Rebecca's reaction. I kind of get Enid's reaction because we see her go through it, through it, but compared to the book, we don't see enough of Rebecca. And that this disintegration of relation of this relationship just feels so minuscule and sudden. At least that's just me. That's just maybe I'm comparing to the book way too much. This is something that I think most people have a problem with when they read the source material first before the before the film. Um, but that's just me. Maybe even that's a personal opinion. But outside of that, the films the films great. The films really good. Three point five out of four. Easy. Totally. I can totally see why people love it. Um, if you're an angsty, you know. Freaking angsty, shy, you know, I, I don't fucking know. If you're an angsty, shy teenager who, who likes to think he's a special, he or she's a special snowflake, like me when I was 15, go and watch this movie, you'll fucking love it. If you're, if you're slightly above that, and you feel like you're superior because of that, you'll still fucking love this movie. It's a good movie anyway. I, I'm sweating like a motherfucker here, I'm gonna stop it. Right about now. Nobody's probably... Nobody's watching up to this point anyway. So yeah. 3.5 out of 4. I gotta sleep. Bye.